Good morning, and welcome to worship on this first Sunday after the Epiphany. It has certainly been a challenging and difficult and week of roller coaster emotions and uncertainty for all of us. I pray that this worship service will give you a, a sense of your place in the world in the midst of all that we are experiencing. Um, today, the first Sunday after the Epiphany, is always the baptism of our Lord. Um, the Epiphany season is one of those seasons which is longer or shorter depending upon where Easter is. Uh, this year there are six Sundays in the season of Epiphany. The first Sunday, as I said, is always the baptism of our Lord. The last Sunday is always Transfiguration Sunday. So today, as we reflect on our baptisms, on the power of the, the Holy Spirit to fall upon us and upon the world, um, I hope that we can uh, find a, a way forward for all of us. Today is, um, there are some special music, of course, in our worship today. We're delighted always to have Jill offer a piano prelude. Uh, Kirk Douglas will sing a solo in the midst of the service, good baritone solo, accompanied by uh, Dwight Killian on double bass. And finally, Lincoln Wright will offer the organ postlude for us as we go forward. With that, uh, let's begin our worship as we prepare ourselves for the time of prayer and reflection during the prelude. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, and whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. 
We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before our words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your life and mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace! Through the power and the promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. And in the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Amen. in the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all. For this holy house, for all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor, that we may live out truth and justice and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. For peace in our hearts, for peace in our homes, for friends and family. For life and for love, for our work and our play, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Oh, 
for your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood let us pray to the lord let us pray to the lord A reading from Acts, the 19th chapter. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. When Paul had, had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ascribe it to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe it to the Lord, glory and strength. Ascribe it to the Lord, the glory to God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord 
voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees ripe and strips the forests bare. And in the temple of the Lord all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. O Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair, and a leather belt he wore around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the river Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. On this first Sunday after the Epiphany, the lectionary, the lessons that are assigned for the day, invite us to witness Jesus' baptism and to reflect on our own. But the language that Scripture gives us is not the language of a kind of churchy decorum. What we have in our lessons for today is a kind of feral language, a language of the untamed and the unpredictable. The reading from Genesis, which was assigned for today, but we didn't read as a part of our service, includes this verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Describes a formless void, a deep, impenetrable darkness. It's not a, a polished basin of, of warm water like we have for our baptisms here in the sanctuary but rather the, the Spirit hovers over something which is elemental, something which has a kind of undifferentiated face, something which is brimming with promise and with risk. Our psalm for today, meanwhile, conjures up a God of storms, of flames, of, of mighty waters, this God thunders and causes oaks to whirl and the oaks of Lebanon to be broken, 
shakes the wilderness. And then in our reading from the New Testament, St. Paul baptizes a group of disciples at Ephesus, causing their tongues to break loose into languages of prophecy that they had never heard or spoken before. And finally, in our Gospel lesson from Mark, we read that when John baptized Jesus, the heavens were torn apart. And the Spirit dive-bombed out of the skies and the very voice of God filled the desert air. What does all of this mean? Why frame Jesus' baptism, and by extension our own, in the language of wildness? Here are a few reasons. There is always wildness at the margins. Mark's gospel makes a point of telling us that John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness. That is to say, he did not conduct his ministry in Jerusalem at the temple, at the center of his people's religious life. Instead, he drew the crowds away from the center, asking them to repent and to believe and to receive a baptism in the wilderness, which may not be all that different than what we have experienced and felt during this pandemic as we have been drawn away, warned against gathering in sacred places, certainly sometimes feels like a wilderness. Astonishingly, the crowds responded to his irreverent invitation. People from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to meet John at the river. Think about it for a moment. John, the camel-wearing, locust-eating prophet, emptied the city. Whatever God was about to do necessitated a sort of decentering, if you will, a disruption, a shift away from business as usual. Jesus was baptized in a wild place, far away from the safe and the routine and the familiar. If we want to follow him in our own baptisms, we too need to listen to the voices crying out in the wilderness. We too need to leave the cities that make up our own particular comfort zones. We too need to allow a good but wild God to disrupt us. According to Christian historians, Jesus' baptism was a bit of an embarrassment to the early church. Apparently, what, what scandalized the gospel writers was Jesus' decision to receive a baptism of repentance. Repentance for what? Wasn't the Son of God perfect, sinless, holy, what was the Messiah doing in the murky waters of the Jordan River, aligning himself with the great masses of the unwashed? And why did God choose that sordid moment to tear the cosmos apart and call Jesus beloved? Why indeed? Why did the Son of the Most High get in line for baptism behind the tax collectors and the sinners, the very folks who could sully his reputation? Why didn't he care about appearances, about disgrace, about guilt by association? I mean, aren't God's children supposed to care about such things? Well, apparently not, because Jesus' first public act was an act of radical solidarity, an act of stepping into the intimate and inextricable, shameful relationship with sinful humanity. Instead of holding himself apart, instead of protecting his own purity, Jesus stepped into the same water that we stand in and wedded his reputation and his destiny to ours. 
In his baptism, Jesus entered the full, unwieldy messiness of the human family. If you heard my Christmas Eve sermon, you heard me say that the manner and the place of Jesus' birth was also a declaration and an act of a God who chose to enter into the messiness of human life and identify not with the, the privileged few, but with the common masses of humanity. Again, in one watery act, Jesus stepped into the whole story of God's work on earth and allowed the story to, to resonate, to deepen, and to, to find completion. In our baptisms, we vow to do the same. In the wild waters of our baptism, we join our beings to all other beings, and we throw our lot in with theirs. I don't know about you, but I, I find this a little bit startling. To embrace Christ's baptismal story is to embrace the wild truth that we are all of us united, interdependent, connected, one. Whether we like it or not, the bond that God seals by the water and by the Spirit is truer and deeper than all other bonds. It makes a stronger claim on our lives and our loyalties than prior claims of race, gender, tribe, nationality, politics, preference, or affinity. It asks that we bear all of the risks that come with belonging. The risk that others might hurt us. The risk that others will change. The risk that they will change us. It is not easy to honor such a staggering claim. But do we have a choice? No, not really. We are the church. But are we known for doing this really well? No, we're not. But that is not because God's claim upon us is optional. It is because that we have tamed baptism. We have turned it into something entirely ritualistic and decorative. But the truth is, we cannot have the water without the kinship. We cannot receive the sacrament without surrendering our separateness. It doesn't matter one bit whether we are non-joiners by temperament. Our baptism is our belonging, our making us a part of all humanity. The concept of a baptismal rite that we do here in the sanctuary is pretty straightforward, but the responsibilities that come with this sacrament are much, much more complex. We all know that, that baptism makes us children of God, and all the privileges that come with that elect position. But most people are not equally knowledgeable about what baptism requires, or possibly we just refuse to accept the responsibility that comes with the privilege. Baptism is a call to discipleship. But what exactly is discipleship? Discipleship can be defined in many ways, but three principles are crucial. To be a disciple first means to be a follower. Through baptism, we become followers of Jesus and followers within the church. Next, baptism calls us to a life of ministry, the work of a disciple. And lastly, discipleship requires that we become evangelists in response to Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations. The process of being a follower of Jesus necessitates our total dedication to his principles and his message. 
We cannot be a follower some days and one who goes alone on other days. Our mind needs to be fixed on the Lord. St. Peter puts it well in his first letter to the church. He says, baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from your body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. Baptism is more than an act. Baptism is a promise. Whether we knew it or not, our baptism bound us to Christ, to the church, and to the world. Thus, our attitude must be to seek a union with God and with all of God's people. Following Jesus is not easy. Nobody ever said that it would be. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous Lutheran theologian who was executed by the Nazis at the end of World War II, knew that the price to be a true follower would be high. In his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer says that to be a follower of Jesus will cost us everything in this life, but it will also lead us to eternal life. Bonhoeffer knew and believed what the scriptures say concerning our baptism into the Christ's death and how it leads to life. St. Paul writes in his letter to the church at Colossia, when you were buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Discipleship requires us to minister to God's people. We are the workers. We are the body of Christ, the hands, the feet, the head. We are members of the priesthood of all believers. But we are not these things all on our own. The Spirit who hovered over the unformed earth at the dawn of creation is the same Spirit who hovers over us at our baptism and hovers over us yet today. The Lord who thundered over the mighty waters during King David's reign is the same God who sits enthroned still. The God who loosened the tongues of first century believers to speak truth to power is the same God who raises up prophets today. In other words, baptism is a place and a moment where the extraordinary of God's grace blesses the ordinary water we stand in or under, and by extension, the ordinary lives which you and I live. It is far too large and too wild a thing for us to tame or control. May we today and always join Jesus as he stands in line at the water's edge, willing to immerse himself in shame and scandal so that all the wild wonder of God might be ours to cherish. May we too hear the delighted voice that tells us who we are and whose we are in the sacrament of baptism. May we, like the disciples at Ephesus, be empowered by the Spirit who moves over, in, and through the chaos. In the wild, untamable water we stand in, in the unpredictable and tumultuous world we live in, may we know ourselves as God's beloved children, disciples of Jesus, spirit-filled and spirit-led, Always. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that guided by the Holy Spirit, they proclaim the forgiveness of sins, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For wilderness and water, wind and wild beast, and all living things on earth, that God's goodness is revealed through creation and faithful stewards care for all God has made. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for laborers busy both day and night, and for peacemakers amid strife, that God inspire all people to use their strength wisely. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the sick and those who provide medical care, for the imprisoned and those who show them mercy, for the lonely and those who provide companionship, for all who suffer, especially Bob and Bob, Michelle and Ryan, Anne, Jackie, Kim and Marshall, Katie, George, Sherry, Jaron, Tony, Patsy, Mary Lou, Mark, Stacy, Terry, for Tim, Scott, Marie, Robert, Marissa, John, Marilyn, Scott, Susan, George, Daniel, Pete, and the 33rd IBCP, Donna, Glenn E., Michael and Teresa, Jory and Lester, Mike. Carol, Kirsten, Ryan and Connor, Ron, Joel, Phil, Amanda, Jim, Rick, Kathy, Laura, Joe, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Umberto. For Tom, Corinne, Debbie, Ellen, John, Monica, Cam, Joel, Jeff, Ollie, Stephanie, Brett, Jean, Donna, Jean, and Ruth. May God shower compassion. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For all congregations, for students returning to school, for those seeking renewal in their daily work, that all the beloved of God experience grace and peace, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their labors, that their witness inspire us in our baptismal vocations, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent. For the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. O soul, have you been weary and troubled? There's no light in the darkness. You can see. There's light for a look at the sea. And a life that's more abundant and free. In the light 
a visible turn and grace. Let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with our own heart. Nourish us anew in your tender care, and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Our Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. For the remembrance of me. 
For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. And now let us pray together in the words which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is ready. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted upon your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.